Well, good morning. In case you don't know, I'm the wife of that handsome redhead right there. And uh, he asked me to share. Well, actually, I've had this word in my heart since about January. Uh, in January, our daughter Riley and I, she's just, well, she's 20. And we went down to Passion Conference. Anybody ever heard of Passion Conference? It's where 50,000 young adults and young students come to worship God, to hear ministry. And it was just incredible to, to see people worship and, and just to get fed and to hear a lot of new artists. A lot of artists debuted new songs. And uh, Brooke Ligerwood and uh, Brandon Lake wrote a song together, and it was called Honey in the Rock. And I loved it. I, there was a whole bunch of songs that I loved. You know, I kept sending uh, Jackie text messages. We got to do this song. We got to do this song. <laughs> I've got the whole album, the Brooke uh, Ligerwood, uh, that I want her to do. So we'll be, <laughs> they'll be working hard in the next couple months. But uh, so... Uh, anyway, Riley and I, that honey in the rock, it just really resonated with me. And I knew that the word of God is considered to be, hun you know, likened to honey. I know that it's something sweet. So I began to dig in and to research and to find out what this song meant. And we're going to sing it right after this. And uh, they did it so well in rehearsal. I can't wait for you to hear it. But I wanted, I knew that the word honey was used many times in scripture. And if you're following along, you can go to our CityGate app. Our CityGate app under Sermon Notes has it, and you can find the scriptures there and a few points there. But I knew that, you know, God's word was considered sweeter than honey, honey in the rock. So what did it actually mean? You know, honey, especially back in the day, back in Bible times, was one of the, considered one of the necessities of life. Um, a Jewish scribe, scribe wrote once, he said, the principle things for the whole use of man's life. Here it is, guys. This is all we need in man's life. Our water, fire, iron, salt, flour, or wheat, honey, milk, and the blood of the grape, oil, and clothing. So there you go. That's all we need. That's what it was considered back then. You know, honey has great benefits. Um, I'm not a great lover of honey. I like it on specific things, but, uh, and there are certain things that I just love. Only honey will do. But I know, and I, and I know that there are great benefits for it. I know that local honey, that if you, if you buy local honey, it's good for allergies or, you know, uh, has different antibodies on it. So Amy over here, she, she, you just got some bees and hives, or, or she's doing all that bee-making stuff. So if you've got any honey bee questions, go see a Amy after church. So I said, do you know of any place where I can get it? So she, she brought me some, some honey and... and um, and I was thankful for it because to me there's a difference in just the processed stuff that, you know, they do in the store and local honey. And it, but, you know, studies suggest that honey uh, might offer to be an antidepressant, an anticonvulsant, anti-anxiety benefits. It's even shown to prevent memory disorders. Do you want some honey? <laughs> <laughs> I need some too. It's also helped in wound care, or in, especially like in burns, to put you know, natural honey on there. And God's word, we'll see as we, as we go through it this morning, that God's word is compared to being sweeter than honey. Luke 19 describes, describes his word as the law, or the commandments, or the decrees, or the instructions. Whenever you see those words, especially in Psalms, it means God's word. It means scripture. It means the Bible, what we know of the Bible. So Psalms 19, verse 10, says, More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of honeycomb. Have you ever tasted honey straight from the honeycomb? It's just pure. It's, it's so sweet, so rich. You know, there was a, this was what I was asking Rich about. I'm like, I remember you saying this one time. You know, we have our Bibles, or we have you know, our devices where our Bible is. But back in the day, they had scrolls, or they had what they called, the Jewish people had a Torah. It was so it was, you know, written out the laws of the scriptures, the five, first five books of the Bible called the Pentateuch, that was the Torah. So in med medieval times, there was a Jewish custom that they would take the Torah, and uh, for young boys, young girls, the young children who were, who were just being raised, to tell them what God's word was like, to tell them what scripture was like. It says, as he reads the letters, they are covered with honey, and he is made to lick it so that the words 
of the Torah should be as sweet in his mouth as honey, as it is said in Ezekiel 3.3. 3. It tasted as sweet honey to me. So if you can imagine, if you can imagine your young children, and you're teaching them about God. God is good. He's so awesome. His word, the words that God speaks, our scripture, they're like honey. They're like honey. And you taste, taste God's word. You taste God's word and you... It's like honey in a honeycomb. That's how sweet God's word is. It's delicious. It's sweet. You get that in your, in your mind, that sweet. Now, I... I practiced this yesterday. <laughs> Y'all are freaking out. Don't worry. There's this little secret trick in there. <laughs> Do I have any honey on my lips? So as I did that, I was practicing it yesterday. I just make sure it was like, I'm telling you this, raw honey stays with you for hours. I, could t- I, I didn't drink anything. I, I might need to get some water because it's, it's rich. It's sweet. That's what God's word is. Yes, it is. Sweet like rich. (laughs) But God's word is like that. When we get God's word, when we read it, when we think about it, when we take a scripture and we just meditate over it. Meditate just means to go over and over and over it. Kind of like the the analogy you've heard of a cow that has four stomachs, you know, and they digest their food and then they regurgitate it they chew it again and chew their cud they just it just keeps going up in other words we take god's word in every situation that we're in that we're facing we take god's word and we say god your word works in this situation whether it's finances whether it's healing whether it's peace of mind whether it's joy that you need you take god's word and you lick it and you get it on the inside of you and that savior you can taste god's word when people have harsh words towards you or bad attitudes towards you, you think of the sweetness of God's word. God's word says, I am love. I am patient. I am kind. I can endure this situation. That's what honey was like. Honey was like, like the honeycomb. Deuteronomy 32, 13 says, let them ride over the highlands of the feast on the crops of the field. He nourished them with honey from the rock and olive oil from stony ground. Wild honey was honey stored by bees in rocks or trees. If there wasn't a place for bees to create a hive, say like a lot of times you'll see it in a tree or maybe even sometimes under a house, under an eave, something like that. But if there, if there are not a place, say like a place in the desert or in the wilderness, that bees would find a crevice in a, and make and create a nest within that rock, within a cave. We're going to look at Psalms 81, where this comes from, if you want to turn there or look in your notes. Psalms 81, and we're going to dive into what it means to honey in the rock. What does it mean, honey in the rock? God says that he is going to reveal himself to us, he's going to show himself, and he's sweeter than honey, like honey in the rock. Let's go back. Remember the children of Israel, God's chosen people. They were under slavery in Egypt, and remember Moses? And Moses went to the Pharaoh and said, let my people go, went through all those things. Finally, the Pharaoh let them go, and Moses and, was it like three million people? Something like three million people that God said that they provided, he provided for them. They crossed the Red Sea on dry land. There was always provision for them. Now, it was rough. They wandered in the wilderness for a long time. 40 years, but he provided a cloud in day. They followed this cloud so they knew where to go. They didn't have GPS, but they had a fire by night to keep them warm and to lead them in the night. And then they would camp and they would set up tents and they would stay there for a while. God provided food for them to eat. There wasn't, in the wilderness, there is no food. So what did God bring down from heaven? Manna. Manna was, says it was like wafers dipped in what? Honey, wafers dipped in honey. So they pro- God provided. He, when they got tired of that, God provided them with quail. So many things that he provided them. He provided them with water when there was no water. He said, strike a rock, and the water gushed out. Their clothes and their shoes never wore out. That's a pretty good deal, isn't it? Yes, God provided for them. So we're going to look. So Psalms 81 is a reminder to his people of what? Israel went through, through that dry time, that wilderness. Sing praises to God, our strength. Sing to the God of Jacob. 
sing, beat the tambourine, pray, play the sweet lyre and the harp, blow the ram's horn at the new moon, and again at the full moon to call a festival. For this is required by the decrees of Israel. It is a regulation of God of Jacob. He made it a law for Israel when he attacked Egypt to set us free. I have heard an unvoice, unknown voice say, Now I will take the load from your shoulders. I will free your hands from their heavy tasks. You cried to me in trouble, and I saved you. I answered out of the thundercloud and tested your faith when there was no water at Meribah. Listen to me, O people. I will give you stern warnings. O Israel, if you would only listen to me, you must never have a foreign god. You must not bow down before a false god, for I, it is... For it was I, the Lord your God, who rescued you from the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide, and I will fill it with good things. But no, my people wouldn't listen. Israel did not want me around, so I let them follow their own stubborn desires, living according to their own ideas. Oh, that my people would listen to me. Oh, that Israel would follow me walking in my paths. How quickly I would then subdue their enemies. How soon my hands would be upon their foes. Those who hate the Lord would cringe before him. They would be doomed forever. But I would feed you with the finest wheat. I would satisfy you with wild honey from the rock. Psalms 81 is about reminding the people of God. It was, they were calling them to a feast, to a, ta to a, a celebration. Let's sing, let's get joyful. Let's it was called the Feast of Tabernacles or Feast of Booths. In other words, it was a time that they remembered their wandering in the wilderness where they dwelt in tents, where they didn't have houses. So if you can imagine, this is still God's, Jew God's people, the Jewish people. This is after they've come out of the way. He says, I want you to remember those days. I want you to remember the provision that I had, that when you were w wandering out there in the wilderness, in the desert, in the nothingness, that I provided for you. If you can imagine coming from your nice comfort of home and like, okay, kids, come on, let's go. We're going to go um, put up some, they called them booths, but really it was just sticks and branches and they would, they put them all together and they'd live out there for about a week. You know, probably kids would probably love it, you know. I don't know, me, I would, where's the electricity, you know? But it was, it was a time to remember the wandering in the wilderness the living, that God's, pro God's provision for their meals, for their manna, for their water, for the honey, for the direction, the protection that God gave them for that. And it was also a time for Israel to point to them to the truth that redemption came only through the forgiveness of sins. You know, the Israelites wandered in the wilderness, and the wilderness is used throughout the Bible quite a bit. It's a, it, there's a theme about it. God wanted his people in this psalm to remember their time in the wilderness, to remember their wandering around. And, but then in the New Testament, we see that there was a voice crying in the wilderness, and his name was John the Baptist, that there was a wilderness. And then when Jesus, after Jesus had been called and anointed, and he was set out to do his ministry where John the Baptist baptized him, you know, and the dove came out and God's voice spoke. Before he began his public ministry, where did Jesus, where did the Holy Spirit lead him? Into the wilderness. And there he was spent 40 days and he was tempted. He came out, that says the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness. Can I tell you that there are times in our lives that we are in a desert? that we're in a wilderness. And it may be, some of it may be because of our own, you know, bad decisions or whatever, but there are other times where we think we're doing everything that we know to do and things just happen. Bad things just keep happening and you're thinking, wow, I thought I was supposed to be living for God. Why am I in this dry place? Why am I in this wilderness? Wilderness, the definition of it is an uncultivated, uninhabited, inhospitable region. Have you ever been in a season of your life where it was inhospitable? This is not comfortable. I do not like this. The most intact, undisturbed, wild, natural area are left on our planet. It's truly one of the wild places that humans do not control. Wilderness, a place intact, but humans, there is no control over it. There's nothing out there. I think sometimes that we ourselves find ourselves in wilderness where we have no control over it. 
we're just in a, a situation and it's like, I don't know what else to do. But you know what? God has provided honey in the rock. He's provided a sweetness for us in those wilderness. A wilderness is a desert. There's no forest. There's no trees. It cannot support human life. Just as a physical desert or the physical wilderness can't support human physical life, so the world, what the world has to offer, can never fulfill that deepest human longing. Never. Only Jesus can satisfy that. Jesus is our only source. He's our only place that we can go to and find that refuge, that strength, that things. When things go awry in your life, when the well dries up and it looks like there's no water, when your food source seems to have gone away, and you're looking for something that brings fulfillment or, or, or satisfaction, Jesus is our only source. Your wilderness could be maybe it's when your health goes away. Maybe it's when you get one bad report, or after, a pa- bad report after another. Or maybe it's things in your life that still just keeps happening to, p- to people that you love around them, and you think, how much more of this can I take? So much grief, so much sorrow, so much hardness. So, God, where are you? Your wilderness could be maybe when, when a, a relationship dries up. Or you know, the person that, you, that you're married to, that they're, they're dissatisfied. They don't want any more of it. You're like, God, where? I feel like I'm in a wilderness. Maybe you're single, and you're like, God, how much more of this singleness can I take? I need, I need some help. I need some support. And Jesus says, I am your source. I am the only one that can feel, fulfill that need. Maybe it's when a career goes away or the money dries up where finances, one thing happens after another and, you're, and you don't have the money there. Sometimes we find ourselves in the wilderness and people all, all often will say, well, why did God let this happen? Why did this happen? Or if only if this didn't happen and if that didn't happen, then I'd be joyful, then I'd be happy, then I'd be content if this didn't happen. We, t- we tend to think that it's God's job to arrange everything so that we're just happy and we're content. We're just, everything's just going wonderful. You know what, people? We live in a broken, imperfect world. There are wildernesses that, and deserts that we may be led to by the Holy Spirit. Because he wants to say, I want to test you. I want to prove you that to, to the world or whatever. There's, some, there's gold in you. And this fire or this test, this wilderness is going to prove you. The Bible says in Psalms 81, it, and he's telling his people, he's saying, get real. This world cannot supply you with the deepest needs of your heart. It can't fulfill it. It won't. It won't fulfill the deepest longing of your heart. Life is a desert, and it can, you cannot sustain your heart without God, without God being your number one source. But you know what? Out of that time where your singleness is just wearing on you or the bad things are happening one after another or maybe the finances have dried up, out of that most difficult thing, God can bring sweetness. God can bring good. There's honey in the rock. When it seems like you're out there in the wilderness of whatever you're going through, whether it's your career or relationship or hardship, when you go into God, and you search for what God's, what God's word says. What does God's word say about my situation? There's honey. There's sustenance. There's provision for you. There's honey in the rock. God says, I can bring you love, joy, peace, provision if you come to me. You have to seek him out. It's not just going to just dump on you like, well, I'm out here in this wilderness. God, I need some honey. Come on, bring it down. I need some water. No, you have to go find and search. It might be in a rock, in a crevice, in a cave where it looks dark and lonely, but you know, you keep searching. You keep digging. You keep, because that belongs to you. That provision belongs to you. And you can have that when you search his word. Everything you, you need, he's got. Everything. You need, you need help with your kids, he's got it. You need wisdom for your job, he's got it. You need answers. God, I don't know which direction to take. It doesn't say it in your word. I don't see it exactly word for word. You begin to follow him and God's word will speak to you. 
You know what? Even in those dark desert wilderness times, he gives us enough strength to hold on. And he says, I'm going to bring something sweet and something joyful out of it. Romans 8, 28, we know this one. It says, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called, called according to his purpose for them. It doesn't, this verse doesn't say, well, just everything's going to work out fine and dandy and it's all going to be, it doesn't say everything has a good result, but out of the wilderness, God can make you something sweet. He'll make you more like Jesus. You look in the reflection of, of his word and you're more like Jesus. It will deepen your joy. Why? Why does God take us through wilderness? Why does he take us through deserts? Why do these things happen? It's not always because we've been disobedient. Sometimes God's trying to teach us something to pass that test. Why? Just so that we're like, oh, wow, look what I did. No, it's to help others on the way. It's to be able to minister to others. God can use that pain. God can use that loneliness so that you can reach out to others, so that you can show them where the honey in the rock is, so that you can show them where the manna, where the water is that they need to, to drink. You know, in Psalms 81, it says, if my people, if you'll do these things, and I'm going to you, give you four things that, he looks, that we're going to look at today, that if we do these four things, we can get strength, and we can get answers, and we can find that honey in the rock. Number one is rejoice. That first few verses of Psalms 81 is like, sing, shout for praises, play your instruments, beat on the tambourine, rejoice. Praise him. There's power in praise. He told them, he says, I'm making this a decree. In other words, this is a commandment. You're, you're supposed to do this. You're supposed to come together. Come together as a corporate body and to worship and to praise him. There's, yes, there is something about worshiping and praising on your own. I love going on walks and putting on my earbuds and put on some worship music and just pray and sing. And nobody but me and the birds can hear, or at least I hope. But you know what? It's even when you get together, when you come together, there is power in corporate praise. Corporate means that y'all here. Love you guys at home too. We invite you to come here. But there is something powerful about being together. And God told them in Psalms 81, he said, come together. Come together in praise because there's power in that. Because you know what? When the music's going, the praise team's up here, the drums are hitting it, and the, and the keyboard, and everything, everybody's going together in unity. It's something that will gently force your heart to remember the good things of God, to remember what He's done. That when you're going through that desert, God, I remember your faithfulness. I remembered when you healed my child. God, I remember when you saved my marriage. God, I remember that even though I had grief, God, you were there to pick me up and to strengthen me and to comfort me. That God, through those hard times, you were there. Through those dark times, you strengthened me. So number one, rejoice. Number two, listen to his voice. Meditate. Go to scripture. Read it. Reflect on it. That's what meditate means, is to read it, to reflect on it to think about it over and over. Put yourself in a position to hear from God. And I think sometimes people say, oh, I wish I could hear from God. I wish I knew God's voice. I just don't hear him. But are you in a position to hear from him? Or are you busy doing stuff? Are you on social media all the time? Are you listening to your radio or listening to your playlist and uh, whatever? Or are you just busy with the kids or busy with your job? Are you in a position to hear from him? You know, prayer and his word should be a part of every part of your day. It's not just when you wake up in the morning and you spend time in prayer, but then throughout the day, he is always on your mind. His word should always be on your mind. God, is this how I react when you quiet yourself on the inside? You know, sometimes I think we just get so busy with, a not, with everything going on that the Holy Spirit's gentle. And he's, he's gentle, and he's going to speak to you in a still, small voice. It might just be a little nudge, a like, mm, I don't know if you should react that way. You might just want to think before you say that. Do you follow that voice, or do you just go ahead, well, I've got a right, and I'm going to say it. 
Listen to his voice. Number three, no foreign gods, especially in the wilderness. In Psalms 81, it talks about to have no foreign gods. But you know, we can recognize in our lives that we don't have idols. An idol is something that becomes your identity. It becomes your source or something or someone that you put more, re- more value on than your relationship with God. Is there something more valuable? It could even be your spouse. It could be even be your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your kids, your job. Do you place more value on that than you do your relationship with God. If you do, that's an idol. Have no idols, no foreign gods. Jesus should be number one in our lives in everything we say, we do, and we speak. Make sure that you examine yourselves for anything that magnifies itself above God. And number four, how do we find honey in a rock? Because Jesus is our rock. Jesus is our rock. In Exodus 17, if you want to go back and look at that and read that, it's a great, talking about, Um, God's chosen people, Israel, they're wandering through the wilderness and they didn't have water. They were in a place where there was not a drop of water. And they begin to, they were thirsty and they begin to complain and, and whine to Moses and say, Moses, did you just drag us out here to die with our children and our animals? We want water. Is God here with us or not? Have you ever found yourself saying, God, did you just bring me here to be a Christian just so that I'd fail? And and don't you even care about me, God? But you know what? There was no water in sight, but God told Moses, he said, go over there to to the rock at Horeb, strike the rock, and water will gush out. And in spite of their grumbling, in spite of their complaining, in spite of their quarreling, God provided for his people. He'll do the same for us. In spite of my grumbling, in spite of my complaining, in spite of my whining sometimes, God said, hey, I've got water for you. That'll, you'll never thirst again. I've got honey for you. I've got all the provision that you need. Remember that wild honey was stored in rocks. That there, there, if there wasn't a place, if there wasn't a place where they could find to make honey, they'd find a place. They'd create something. I want us to look at one last section of scripture, Judges 14. Do you remember Samson? He had great physical strength when the Spirit of God came upon him. It's a great um, story to read. It's not just he had superhuman strength, but but there were certain things that he had to obey and that he had to do. He was a Nazarite, and there were certain things and vows that he had to uphold. But when the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, he had supernatural strength. So Samson and his parents, they're on their way. They're going to go find Samson, a wife. So they're on traveling, and, um, you know, a a lion came up on them. And here's what happened in verse 5. Then Samson went down to his father and mother in Timnah, and they came to the vineyards of Timnah. And behold, a young lion came toward him roaring. Then the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and although he had nothing in his hand, he tore the lion into pieces as one tears a young goat. He did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. When he went down and talked to the woman, she was right in Samson's eyes. Then, after some days, he returned to take her. He turned aside to see the lion, or the, the you know, dead lion, and honey. He scraped it out into his hands and went on, eating it as he went. And he came to his father and his mother and gave them some to eat, and they ate. But he did not tell them that he had scraped the honey from the carcass of a lion." You know, sometimes the hardest, the scariest, the seeming most immovable times in our lives can offer the greatest sweetness. That when there are lions, the very thing that tried to kill Samson and his parents provided him with strength, grace, and hope. When we're out of his presence, when we're out of God's presence, we won't have those things. There are lions that come to try to attack you that try to steal your joy, that try to steal your peace, that try to, to steal your life. But the Spirit of the Lord is within us. You know, back then, they only knew the Spirit of the Lord through the temples or through the priests. But the Bible says that if you've been born again, if you've asked Jesus to be number one in your life, that you want to say, God, I want to serve you all the days of my life, and I believe that you're risen from the dead, and I make you my, my Lord. And in other words, he's number one. It says that the old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And that the Spirit of the Lord resides 
lives on the inside of us. That when we're going through those hard times, through those unexpected journeys, both the good and the kind, you know, life's filled with them. Sometimes it can be a, a wilderness and sometimes it can be a desert. But then there's also joyful times and wonderful times. You know, a good portion of my life has been unexpected journeys. Some of, most of them have been great. And I have, a, have had a wonderful life. But you know what? There's other been jour- journeys that have been incredibly challenging. But God, I don't know. I, God, I just want to give up. I, I don't know if I have any strength more just to keep on going, doing the same thing over and over. And, you know, people are just, they're, they're not cooperating, God. They're not cooperating. I don't know what else to do. But you know what? There's honey in the rock. Have you found your honey? Have you went looking for that honey? And there are, God always has provision for us. He always has our answer. He always has what we need. You know, sometimes it's those big uh, journeys that can turn our world upside down. Or it can turn us closer to him. Yes, things happen in our lives. We go through wilderness. We go through deserts. But you know, God is our source. And when we draw close to him, find time in his presence. What, what do you mean, Paula? What do you mean find time in his presence? It's that alone time. Maybe it's in your car when you just turn off the radio and you just listen to God. God, I love you. I worship you. God, I worship you for who you are. Not for what all the junk and stuff that's happened in my life. God, I just thank you for who you are. There's no one else, God, in this world that, that I would want to put before you. Forgive me, God, if I put something else above you. God, I, I surrender to you. I want all that you... God, if I have to be in the desert or the wilderness forever, God, as long as I've got you, I know that there's provision. God, I know that you've got something sweet in this, but God, I'll serve you even if there's no sweetness. Have you ever come to that? Man, God is so awesome. If everything else goes to pot, if this world goes to hell in a handbasket, and it is, I choose to serve him. I choose to follow him. If I've run out of water, if I've run out of honey, if I've run out of manna, God, I'm still, what? What other choice do I have? Why? Because I remember his faithfulness. I remember his faithfulness. I choose to remember what God has done for me. And God, I know because of your faithfulness that he said, I will never, ever leave you or forsake you. I will not, I will not, I will not. I'm telling you today, find your honey Get into God's word. That's where you're going to find your strength. That's where you're going to find your source of hope, of strength, of everything that you need. Nothing else matters, God. Nothing else but your sweetness. Sweetness. Oh, the sweet. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Are you tasting of him? You might say, hey, I don't feel like I'm, I'm getting fed or I don't, I don't really get it, you know, when I come to church or I just, it's just not really happening for me. Are you tasting and seeing that the Lord is good? Or are you leaving it up to whoever's up here, the pastor or the speaker, to fill your needs? You pick up the spoon. You pick up the word. You spend time in his presence. Feed yourself. You're not, you're not babies. You're not infants. Y'all been, y'all listening here. You've been going for a long time. You've been living, serving Jesus for a long time. Feed yourself. There's honey. There's sweetness in his word. You know, I was saying earlier, there's certain things that I just love honey on, especially, you know, fresh, pure honey. Uh, we lived in, I lived in Australia. I moved there when I was 15 with my family. And um, I consider that my second home. My Uh, dad and my brother and his family are still there so whenever I go have you ever heard of um you know you always think of fancy something fancy tea and crumpets like rich always like oh you you raised by the queen you have tea and crumpets well crumb has anybody had a, a crumpet from England or from Australia okay well crumpet is I'm going to show a picture in just a minute but a crumpet is a cross best I can describe it is a cross between an English muffin and a pancake 
and then you toast them. You can do it different ways, but my favorite way, so you can bring that up, guys. So it's flat on the bottom. And it's flat on the bottom. It's like a, a, almost a rubbery, but then it's got all those little holes in there. And so you toast them really good, and you put butter on it, and it melts in there, and you put honey in there, and it just oozes all into those holes. And you, you, know, you pick it up and you eat it, and it just gets all over you. It's all messy. It's got melted butter and honey, and, but it's chewy and it's goodness. And oh, it's, it's delicious. And I love it with a cup of hot tea. I miss it so much. I've tried, I've ordered Amazon. I've tried the English version. I've tried to find it here in the United States, nothing. So if I ever have someone come from Australia, might bring me some crumpets if you can, because you have to eat them quick because they, they're fresh and they do go moldy. But there's just something so just and that and then when i think of that of of crumpets and honey it's like take god's word spending time in his presence just let it go into all those little nooks and crannies all those little holes just let it feel where it spills out and it just becomes all over you so when you've got god's word in you and you've got to spend time in his presence, that when you're around that crabby old boss you know, you've just, you, you, just honey and, and ooziness and goodness just comes out of you. You want God's word. You want to look like Jesus and to sound like Jesus. Spend time in his word. Spend time in his presence. Spend time praying with him. And learn to look for the honey. Learn to look for God's goodness even in the dark times, even in the wilderness. Find that sweetness in the face of that lion. There's honey in the rock.